Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to today's episode of the Language Lounge. My name is Terry Hammett and I'm sitting in as guest host for Michelle Ola. Today we are honoring the Jour de la Francophonie, which takes place yearly on March 20th. During this time, we take a look at the richness and diversity of the French language and cultures around the world. There are over 369 million French speakers on the earth. And to help us rightly celebrate this day, we've invited a dear colleague of mine, Joseph Dunn, into the conversation. Joseph, a Louisiana native, is well known in regional, national, and international Francophone circles. He has presented in English and French at conferences and political and economic trade missions in the U.S., Canada, the Caribbean, and Europe. He is often featured in Francophone print and broadcast media and documentaries as a leader in the French and cult and Creole language movements in Louisiana. He is regularly quoted in academic journals, publications, and is known as an outspoken advocate for the development of educational, professional, and economic opportunities for these heritage language communities. After three years as executive director of the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana, he began work as an independent tourism and cultural entrepreneur. He has held positions at the Consulate General of France in New Orleans, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, the Louisiana Travel Promotion Association, and the Louisiana Office of Tourism. Internationally, Joseph has twice worked as a product development and interpretation consultant with Parks Canada. He participated in the drafting of the dossier that led to Louisiana's acceptance as an observer member of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, the second largest international body of nations and regions after the UN. Joseph's primary role today is to oversee the communications, public relations, and marketing efforts at LORA, Louisiana's Creole heritage site, highlighting the unique history and reality of Louisiana's diverse mosaic of French and Creole spot populations. Wow. I am totally in awe of all that you have done, Joseph, and I know that I only mentioned just a few of your contributions to the Francophone world. And I'm saying Francophone world because all French, teacher, French speakers, native and non-native speakers alike, can recognize that l'union fait la force and an immense global community does exist. We just need to tap into it. So Joseph, thanks for being here. I'm so excited to have you here. Could you talk to us just a bit about some of your recent work regarding promoting the diversity of the varieties, not only of French in Louisiana, but also in other places as well? Terry, thank you so much for having me today. It's a, it's a real honor to be here with you. We've worked together on lots of projects over the years, so uh, I'm very, very flattered to be included today and to talk about this subject that's so very, very dear to my heart. And, you know, it's it's always interesting when I, I hear my introduction because I like you, when you're in the midst of it doing the work, I don't think you begin to realize how that translates and the 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 enormity of of how it it sounds because i'm just in the middle of it doing it right and so um i often it, it often seems to me like somebody else's bio is being read when when i hear that because i'm just in the midst of it doing it um so talking about diversity yeah i mean louisiana has always been a very very diverse place for um, varieties of French and varieties of Creole. And I know we want to talk about, you know, the world, we want to talk about North America, we want to talk about the United States. And, you know, I, I, I think over time, you know, as we have moved into, um, you know, uh, American mindsets and English speaking mindsets, I think we've forgotten, I know that we have in Louisiana, we've forgotten in the course of just one or two generations, how omnipresent 
the French language and the Creole language were here and how they were spoken by a huge variety of populations, Native American, Afro-descended, Euro-descended, and they have been part of the landscape of Louisiana since the colonial period. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Awesome. I know we do. Well, Joseph, you keep referring to Creole languages. So can you be a little bit more specific since um, this may not be part of it? some people's everyday vocabulary? Absolutely. So um, we do have to go back in time and, and talk very specifically about what in uh, the museum world and what in the, in the public history world is called difficult history now. Uh, that's addressing the idea that we have marginalized populations of Native Americans, we have marginalized populations of Afro-descended people, and uh, the Louisiana colony largely, and let's remember that we have today of an idea about what Louisiana is as a state, but Louisiana was the was the entire center of the North American continent at one time in the 18th century, and uh, it was a place of enslavement. So the French were bringing enslaved Africans from the west coast of Africa in the beginning, Senegal to the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, into uh, Alabama, into New Orleans, what is it now Alabama, into New Orleans, into Mississippi and these areas. And so, you know, these enslaved populations represented at the time of Louisiana's sale by Napoleon to the United States in 1803 in what is now Louisiana, about half of the population. So uh, talking about Creole languages, we have to understand that background of history and that the understanding that these Afro, these Africans were speaking many different languages and they were coming from different ethnic groups. And when they arrived into this uh, French colony, we also have to recall that French was not yet a standardized language either. So you had people from all over what is now France, Belgium, sometimes Switzerland, the Caribbean, and other places that were speaking varieties of what eventually became French. And you have these clashes of these African languages with these dialects of French that then give birth to the Creole languages we know it in Louisiana today. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what in Louisiana, and I know this could open a can of worms, so I'm just asking you for a brief definition, but what is a Creole in Louisiana? Oh boy. Oh boy. I, I, I've, I've come to understand that it's easier to, in a historic context, specifically the 19th century, it's easier to explain to people what Creoles are not than to try to explain what they are. Louisiana Creoles did not consider themselves to be American because Americans were English-speaking Protestants in the Louisiana context in the 19th century. So Creoles were French and Creole-speaking Catholics, no matter what their racial background or their legal status as a free or enslaved person. And we see this in French language documents. Um, that you know, there's this this conflict between these two groups of people, and you might compare that in a more contemporary sense with you know the ethnic and the linguistic uh, conflicts that happen in Belgium between the Flemish and the Walloons, donc le Flam les Flamands et les Wallons, and what happens also in Canada between the Francophones and the Anglophones. So in Louisiana, you had this very clear divided line between Creoles who were speaking French and were Catholic, and Americans who were speaking English and who were Protestant. And the Creoles were here first, right, because Louisiana Louisiana was a French colony from 1699 up until the time that Napoleon sold us to the United States in 1803. These benchmarks and these perspectives have been lost because as we move through time and as we move through the late 19th, early 20th century, coming up to a very pivotal moment in Louisiana history, June 18th, 1921, a new state constitution was adopted and that made English the only language of public education in Louisiana. So language shift, so the imposition of English and the forcible eradication of uh, varieties of French and Creole as languages um, led to a significant identity shift. So people today do not have these kinds of relationships to these words that they once had or to these identities that they once had. And I'll often also, when I'm trying to explain this, 
uh, bring up the point that it was a really big deal in 1960 when John F. Kennedy was running for president that he was Catholic because there was this great conflict in the United States between the older uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment um, in politics and Catholics. Um, and these, again, are not... They, they aren't reference points that we have so much today that were very, very relevant in the United States even 60 years ago when uh, John F. Kennedy was running for president. So these kinds of ethnic conflicts um, between language and culture and things like that are not things that we see or that, we have, or that we're as familiar with now as we were once upon a time because even in Louisiana, everybody is quote-unquote American. Um, everybody's American. And so we see these things through very English speaking American lenses. But, you know, coming back to this idea of language as a filter through which you see the world, um, oftentimes when we look at French language documents historically, when we look at legal documents, when we look at literature, when we read between the lines between uh, in, in, in those kinds of, of, of documents, and we, we can see these, these very clear conflicts between Creoles and Americans based on language, culture, and religion. That is fascinating. Wow. Do you see any implications um, in teaching French, given this history? Oi. Um, it, teaching French in Louisiana specifically or teaching French generally? You could do both. Um, or whatever you French... deem the most important. Well, I mean, I, it's... It's an interesting thing to dig into because with French in Louisiana, there's always going to be an underlying, there's always going to be an underlying um, racial aspect to it. There's going to be an underlying political aspect to it. Um, and for people like me who are very, very deep in the weeds in, in these things, a lot of this, these ideas are, are things that, like everybody knew this 75 or a hundred years ago, but people have forgotten. Right. And so, uh, it, it, it becomes a, an idea when we're doing advocacy for French in Louisiana, trying to get people to understand that this is not a foreign language, um, that it's a heritage language, that it, that, it was a language that was spoken by large swaths of the population, no matter what color they were. Um, so that there's not just one group in Louisiana who historically or even contemporarily has quote unquote owned French. Um, and so giving us this idea that it, or returning to this idea that it was a common language spoken again among these mosaics of populations of people and when it was the common language, or when these varieties were the common language, um, they were, I would, I would say, probably 95% mutually comprehensible among groups um, with the same kinds of regional varieties that we have with English. But because everyone is, is Anglo-dominant now, they're English-dominant, they don't necessarily think about the fact that somebody from New Orleans is going to speak English very differently from, from from somebody from Shreveport, for example, or somebody from Lake Charles will speak English differently from someone from Baton Rouge, because we're so immersed in English that we just, we don't even think about making these adjustments, or that we can easily understand that watching Downton Abbey, for example, or watching Harry Potter, because we're so immersed all the time in English that it's, we just automatically adjust. And because people haven't been exposed in the same way anymore, and even, I'll say, uh, what we might consider to be uh, native speakers of French in Louisiana, I'll put that in quotes because these are going to be people who are 75 years and older. Um, because they're not constantly exposed to the varieties of French, there is a linguistic insecurity that is established Whereas, you know, once upon a time, these people would have been able to navigate within these different French speaking spheres because they were exposed to varieties all the time and they're not anymore. So we've got lots of kinds of, of obstacles to kind of overcome 
And I've been trying to figure out recently how to best articulate this idea of linguistic insecurity in a Louisiana context because the phenomenon exists, but the concept does not. Um, and there's lots of talk about this in Canada, for example, in the provinces outside of Quebec, where you have the Acadians, where you have the Francasquois or the Franco Manitobain or those other people who, when they come into contact, for example, with a Quebecois, will then say or, or you know, think that that person is not a first language French speaker because they're not so much in a um, because the Quebecois are just not used to hearing that other variety of French in the same way that French people, for example, might come to Louisiana or will go to Maine for in New England with the Franco-Americans and then have a, um, uh, have a reaction to the way that, that person is speaking French, who then is not going to speak French to the French person because there's this linguistic insecurity. And how do we then, if we're going to look at regional varieties of French and valorizing regional varieties of French, how do we create atmospheres and create tools for the people who are going to reappropriate or reacquire them so that when they are faced with these kinds of situations, they're able to quote unquote defend themselves and sort of not revert back to English. Um, so it's, and, and I still haven't figured out how quite to, to articulate that way in a very succinct way, because the whole concept of linguistic identity, excuse me, linguistic insecurity doesn't exist here, but the phenomenon does. I really love that. That speaks to me, Joseph, a lot. Um, I personally, like I have definitely experienced linguistic insecurity as a, um, French is definitely my second language. Um, and interestingly, it doesn't, I believe this does not just exist in the Louisiana context. I've spoken to American first language, American speakers of Spanish and the linguistics insecurity that, that they feel. Also heritage learners of Spanish, I hear the same thing. And even, um, when we are talking with teachers about some of the things that we offer in our textbooks, we offer, we have what we call video bloggers within our textbooks. They're, they're really great. They're teenagers and they, um, <clears throat> they represent a, a certain country of focus within our books. And uh, one of the first units has a French speaker, a speaker from France. He's a teenager. And he introduces himself and talks about what he likes. And he says, <coughs> je fais du skate and kind of points to his skateboard. And then later he says, uh, je, je lis des comics instead of les bandes dessinées. And I've had teachers come up to me and say, well, you know, he shouldn't really be saying that, even though everything else was in, in fairly standard French. Um, <clears throat> and... You know, my response to that is just, well, you know, he's using the language just like he would use the language with his friends in his country. And I was just wondering if you have anything um, that you might be able to add to that explanation. I think I, I'm not an academic or a pedagogue or a teacher. Let me just preface everything that I say with that. I'm, I'm a, I am guess I'm what you would call a, a language advocate and a language practitioner, because I'm always looking at these ways in which we can, we can use heritage languages in Louisiana, French and Creole to um, be uh, social and economic development and professional tools, right? So on the on the teacher side, you're teaching young people to speak a language, no matter Spanish, German, French, whatever, and you're giving them these tools and you're telling them in the classrooms, languages lead to jobs. On my side of the thing, here in Louisiana very specifically, I'm saying the jobs aren't there and we need to create the jobs because we have no passerelle, um, uh, there's no, there's no pathway there's no um there's no connection between the business world and 
the language communities to bring students in to train them to work in language. And I'm in tourism and culture in Louisiana, and I'm at a historic house museum where we are the only place in Louisiana as a historic house museum to offer daily tours in French, which makes no sense because it's, 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 it's an obviously evident thing to, uh, especially, you know, given the fact with Louisiana's history and how we uh, promote Louisiana as this place, that, which was a former French colony, we've got this food, we've got this music, we've got this culture and all of that. And then French speakers arrive here and they have a very difficult time to find even brochures, even printed materials in, in their language. And so, you know, there's a whole world of opportunity to create uh, jobs using uh, the French language. This even happens in Spanish. Uh, I We toyed with the idea at Laura, at once upon a time, Laura Plantation, of having uh, tours in Spanish and just sort of testing it. And I, with my daughter, we went out to eat a couple of times at, um, at Latin restaurants, and I asked the servers, do you... Are there places in Louisiana or even in New Orleans where you can go as a tourist and get services in Spanish? And the answer to that was no. They all go to Florida uh, to to do Spanish language activities. Um, and so, generally speaking, in Louisiana, we're way, way, way far behind on uh, creating jobs, uh, even in the tourism sector, uh, which is sort of for me the the most obvious place where you would be able to use a language other other than English. And on the flip side of this, and when you start, you know, talking to the tourism professionals, um, say, okay, have you been to Bolivia? Have you been to China? Have you been to France? Have you been somewhere else? Did you find services in English in those places? Yes, of course. Well, then why aren't we doing a better job of creating opportunities for these, you know, young for these students who are in either immersion pathways or who are in uh, second language pathways so that we can retain them here in in that language and you know I'm one of those people who um, you know constantly says and I get sometimes you know a little bit chastised for it that you know unless there's an economic reason to speak the language um, just because it's, you know, our grandparents spoke it, that, that nostalgia for something is not going to be enough for someone to really, especially young people, uh, to, to really, you know, uh, hone in and, and, and be anchored in this language that they're either learning or reacquiring or, or appropriating. Interesting. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I was in Oklahoma last week, um, and I was I was pretty amazed. I was in Oklahoma City, actually, and there was Spanish all over the place. And I was thinking to myself, boy, this would be a great place to learn Spanish. Um, and, of course, Texas, you know, being close, close by. Um, so, let's see, I lost my train of thought there, but... Um, Def well, I think I think what you're what you're what you're seeing is that Spanish is a language of consumerism, and because there is consumerism behind it, there are services in the language. And so, if, for example, we had um, a consumer population of people in Louisiana or in New England with the Franco Americans or in other places, a consumer population of people who were speaking French and who were looking for services in French, then that could then influence, that could then on the flip side influence students to want to learn whatever language it is because they will see that there's possibilities and opportunities in that language. There in Florida, I mean, if you think about the snowbirds that come down from French-speaking Canada into Florida every every winter, um, th there are places in Florida that become completely Quebecois or Acadien or whatever, and they have French language services. They have French language newspapers and and um, services in Florida, and it, it's like okay, they can go to Florida and do that, and they can't come to Louisiana and do that. What what's wrong with this 
this picture. And then even up in um, New Hampshire, you mentioned that you were reading the book of French All Around Us. So uh, one of the other contributors to that is Dr. Kate Harrington. She's in New Hampshire, and I forget at which university, so I'm not going to try to say it because I'll mess it up. But anyway, she worked on an initiative, a tourism initiative in New Hampshire, because they're just across the border from Quebec, About uh, and, and their idea was to sort of uh, look at how they can train local French speakers to then interact with visitors from, from, from Quebec and use that as an economic development tool. So, you know, th there are initiatives kind of all over the place. They're looking at some of these kinds of things in Maine as well. Um, and I, I know that I'm really Louisiana focused in much of what I do, but I've made some really good, uh, contacts and, and friendships in Maine, in New Hampshire, in New England, and have been, become very interested in the parallels of what uh, happens in Louisiana and what's happening with the Franco-American populations in, in New England. And there, there are incredible similarities. Um, and the, the challenges are very, very much the same about, you know, taking these people who were heritage speakers and then you know, re, um, I suppose, revalidating them or revalorizing them in some language. And there was a great little film, a little short film that came out last year or the year before. I've completely lost track of time. I have no idea what's when anymore after the pandemic. But it was called Le Carrefour, so The Crossroads. And it's about this uh, woman uh, who was originally from a French-speaking community in Maine, from Lewiston, Auburn, Maine. She left when she got married and did everything she could to distance herself from her, her accent, her language. And then after she was widowed, she moved back to her hometown and found herself in a changing, a very changed place, um, but where there are lots of French-speaking African refugees and resettled people and being drawn into that and using her French now and reclaiming her French through these interactions with, with African immigrants, um, which was something she never, ever could have imagined growing up as a Franco-American girl in Lewis and Auburn back in the 1950s and 1960s. So, you know, talking about, you know, French or other heritage languages, you know, there's not obviously just the economic or the professional possibilities there. It, it's also the human, it's also the human component because when you speak another language, you have an immediate connection with, with someone who also speaks that language. And that level of connection or that level, even the viscerality can sometimes be, uh, be pretty incredible. Um, I use often the anecdote of being with a, a French journalist. It's quite a number of years ago and he was from Paris and he was, I mean, if you can just imagine the stereotypical French journalist, he's like chain smoking. He's really, I, I hate to be, I, I, I hate to generalize and use cliches, but anyway, he was, he, he was not, he was not the easiest person to deal with. Let's just put it that way. He was not easy to deal with. And so I'm driving him around. And we ended up, I forget exactly where, we stopped to grab a coffee at some little roadside place and we were chatting, sitting there drinking coffee, chatting, and this little elderly lady sort of tottered over and she said in her French, vous êtes à préparer français? And so y'all are speaking French. And he turned, like his, I thought he was going to whiplash his, his head. He turned quickly to her. And he started talking to her and he completely changed. He completely changed. He became a completely different person. And he chatted with this lady for, you know, probably 30, 45 minutes, just about everything and nothing. And when we left, he said to me, Joseph, that was the first time in 30 years that I've heard the voice of my grandmother because his grandmother was from this little village out in the middle of nowhere in France. And this little old lady in, in Louisiana spoke exactly like his grandmother. And that's one of those things that we're, I, I wish I could adequately convey to people um, who 
don't grasp the that kind of connection that comes with with language and with people from other places who come to Louisiana and who interact with the way that people speak French here or the way that people speak Creole here because it's and oftentimes it's it's things that that they don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a sensory memory for them that they don't even know they've forgotten or that they don't even know that they they didn't know that that they they were looking for. And um you know, there's the example also of, you know, in Nova Scotia, in upper Nova Scotia, in Cape Breton Island, where there are Gaelic speaking communities. Um, there are people from Scotland who come to Nova Scotia to relearn traditional Scottish music and Scottish dancing and things like that. And so we, when you have these diaspora communities like that, um, there are things that are going to disappear in the place where they originally were from, but that are going to be maintained in the diaspora communities. And so uh, it's, it's always interesting for me to see those kinds of interactions between people from somewhere else and something that's happening here. Mm. And, you know, I, I've even seen that in, in listening to and talking to people, for example, from, from New England. Um, there are so many similarities in the way that they speak French in New England and the way they speak French in Louisiana. And even in Missouri, with you know old mines and and uh, those you know French speaking pockets within what is now the the United States. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Um, I'm thinking about um, some of the. Well, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and so um, I was when I moved here to Louisiana. I was just totally amazed and enthralled, and wanted to totally get involved with the French-speaking community here in Louisiana. And in speaking with what David Cheremy and others talk about as the lost generation, so the generation that did not get to speak French um, <clears throat> because their parents were punished for speaking French. And I talked to, for example, somebody like Amanda Lafleur, who is um, truly an expert in Louisiana French. And she talks about, of course, she did not grow up speaking French, but she did hear it. And she talks about this other identity that she has when she speaks French. So she has her <clears throat> her American or her her English, her Anglophone identity. <clears throat> but then there's another window, another door that opens to her. She has a totally different personality, she has said, uh, when speaking French. And I just think that that opportunity, not only for Louisiana students, because I'm going to put myself out on a limb and say that learning French, as well as learning Spanish, for students in Louisiana is really our birthright because those are our heritage languages, but along with others. But I'm also like for students throughout the United States um, or the Americas, if you want to go even further, learning a heritage language, Learning another language, no matter what it is, opens doors, economic doors, um, social doors, global doors. It makes me think about um, when we were in the process in Louisiana, but it doesn't have to be Louisiana. We were in the process of um, developing a World Heritage Site in the Northeast of Louisiana and the United Nations, I think it was a UNESCO World Heritage Site that we wanted to um, we wanted to be recognized. And the United States at the time was not well uh, viewed by the international community at the UN. And so the back door for this to be recognized was to go through uh, l'OIF, l'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. And we got it because of that window. And I think there are so many opportunities. And I'm going to go out on a limb even further and just say, because Spanish is omnipresent along the coasts, the East and the West Coast, Florida, Texas, all over the place, that 
when we can focus on something that's a little bit different, like French, there are more windows available to our students. I just wanted to get, I, I know you're not a pedagogue, but you're about opportunities. Um, for, well, I, I th go ahead, for people. I, I, I think um, I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to organize and articulate succinctly my thoughts. And what I think that I have finally been able to, to say is that there will, if, if, a, if, a, if a student, for example, is coming for a first time into a language classroom and only speaks English, the idea that and I'm speaking specifically about Louisiana, the idea that Spanish will be more useful than French, I, th I would say is not necessarily true because I think there are always going to be enough native Spanish speakers to fill jobs. I don't think that a student from Louisiana who has two or three or four years of high school Spanish is necessarily going to have more opportunities because they had that language, because I think there are always going to be enough native speakers of Spanish to fill jobs in Louisiana. However, the student who re um, acquires French or who acquires French for uh, the first time, in my observation, having done the jobs that I've done and having sat on scholarship committees and having helped written recommendation letters and having the, the window that I have into the French speaking world in Louisiana and globally, I think students are going to have more opportunities with French in Louisiana than they will with Spanish. That's my observation. Because in a more global context french speakers from louisiana are we're, we're, we're kind of like unicorns we're not supposed to exist and when we do show up then everybody wants to hear about who we are why we're why we still exist we were supposed to disappear in 1803 um how is it that we're still speaking french like people in the french speaking world are very very interested in this at the regular normal everyday person level all the way up to the, uh, the the ministerial levels and i think we can even say that with the visit of uh, president macron in december of 2022 to louisiana to new orleans he did his speech in french that was I, I don't know that a lot of people realize what a statement that was, that all of the time that he spent in D.C., never once did he do a public speech in French. He spoke English. When Macron came to New Orleans and he did his public gathering at the New Orleans Museum, Museum of Art, he did his entire speech in French. That was a huge statement on the fact that there are actually French-speaking people in Louisiana. And in that room were indigenous people, were Afro-descended people, were uh, quote-unquote white people. I mean, it was a uh, rather diverse group of people that was in that room listening to the president of France speak French about you know, the initiative, um, oh goodness, what did it, it's, he, he kept joking that all these new initiatives that are coming out are like English language words. Um, and that he knew that he needed to probably put them in French eventually, but, um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a pretty amazing thing. And, you know, unless you're in the world of, um, language advocacy at an international level, those little subtle things like that aren't necessarily going to resonate. Um, but that the president of France did his speech in French in Louisiana was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's a political statement. Um, and I love that he was able to do that. And it also makes me think of a, an initiative um, in Nova Scotia that Louisiana adopted, but 
uh, once again, I see, I see this as something that teachers can talk about in their classes, and that is uh, being Franco responsable. Um, so no matter where we go, we hear, we do hear Spanish. Of course, we hear English everywhere. We hear Spanish in a lot of places and occasionally in the urban settings, we hear a lot of other languages, but as a French speaker, being able to not only ask for services in French, but actually to just speak French with a friend in an elevator is being Franco responsable to, to show um, others that there is a vibrant language. The French is a vibrant, dynamic language that is being used in the US, I think is an important message, political statement to get across. Um, I know that on social media, a lot of times I post in both languages, French and English. Um, and that is a political statement. Well, I, I would also, in, in that same vein, because you mentioned Nova Scotia and you mentioned, um, and you mentioned Franco Responsable, the, I, I think we lose sense, and I, I know I experienced this as a student of French when I was in high school and even when I was at university, that our relationship to French in the United States is Europe. And we don't have enough focus or enough materials or enough um, sensibilisation to the fact that French is a North American language. French has been a North American language since the 17th century. And you know, there are, according to the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques, which I would encourage all teachers listening to this to check out because they have incredible resources on their website. There are videos, there's a virtual library, um, there are all kinds of pedagogical resources. It is an incredible, incredible resource for teachers and for students. And for students, particularly once they're done with high school, their main focus at the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques is the 18 to 35 age group. So they do all kinds of initiatives where they will invite young people to these networking events. They happen all over Canada. They happen all over the United States. They're actually doing their Université d'été in Lafayette in Louisiana this year in May. Um, so, uh, I was going somewhere with this. Um, uh, so this, this idea of French as a North American language and how do we pull back a little bit from this idea that, um, and, and I love France. It's one of my favorite places. I love cheese. I love, I love wine. I love France. I love architecture. I love France, but you know, there's there's also places here in the United States where this is very much and always has been a living, vibrant language in Louisiana, in New in New England, in Maine, and New Hampshire, and, and all these places, and obviously in in Canada. So, um, Claire Marie Brisson, Dr. Claire Marie Brisson, who is now at Harvard, has a great podcast called um, Oh Lordy. Uh, see, now I'm not going to be wrong. I should have written notes because I, I should have written notes so I could remember. So anyway, she's got this, uh, it's, I, I think it's a North American, is it the North, Amer the, the North American legacy podcast or North American French legacy podcast, something like that anyway. And she just launched this past year at Harvard university, a course on French speaking North America. Um, so, you know, there, we're beginning to see in university settings this focus more on the fact that you know French is not just France, it's not just Belgium, it's it's actually a North American language, and uh, I I really hope that we can begin to to be more uh, uh, conscientisé to that. Yeah. Yeah, this conversation is so rich, Joseph. I'm really enjoying it. I do 
very quickly, I want to uh, relate an anecdote, something that happened to you and me um, when we were in France. For the audience, just to let you know, like Joseph is an amazing speaker of French. And before we end, I'd love if you could tell a quick story about, um, you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> but if you could tell a quick story before we leave about how you learned French. But uh, what I want, the anecdote I want to tell is that the first time, I, I don't know if this was the first time you went to France, Joseph. It was uh, like in 2012, 13, and we went together for work. And um, you speak, uh, you can speak many different varieties of French, but you're, you were speaking France French. And we went to a, a boulangerie to get our lunch uh, with Peggy Feehan. And uh, you spoke beautiful French when you asked and you ordered what you wanted at the boulangerie. And then the woman told you how much it cost and you searched in your pocket for your euros. You brought them out in your hand and you had not never paid for anything in euros before. And so uh, you finally figured out what the money was. She helped you out and you walked out and you said, oh my gosh, I feel so stupid. Um, do you remember that? <laughs> it's it's become quite the um, quite the anecdote that has I think made the rounds of lots of uh, dinner parties and 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 other things. Yeah, no, it was not the first time I had I was in France. Actually, I I've been in I was in France. I've been in France several several times, but it was the first time that ever sort of done that whole experience of the lunch counter where you have lines of people coming in, trying to quickly order their things with all of the formule and all of that and telling the woman, it, it was like a scene out of a comedy sketch. It really was because I stood back. I don't know if you recall this, but I stood back and I observed for a little while before I jumped into the line to try to order. And so I get up there and I feel all this pressure of all these people behind me, like, dude, hurry up, order. Like we need to get back to work. And I'm just overwhelmed by the, by the, 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 all of the different things that, that, that there are. And so I finally was just like, okay, I'm going to have the, I'm going to, and I pointed like, you know, a three-year-old, I'm going to have the sandwich there. And then she's like, okay, it's going to be whatever it was. And I just didn't have time. I felt like I didn't have time to count because all these people were glaring at me behind. And I know that they had to be thinking, who is this person who, you know, he's, he's obviously an extraterrestrial or something. And so anyway, yeah, I, that, that's one of my favorite stories to tell. Yeah. yeah. It's a great it's story. And it's a I, great story. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, as we're talking about the internationalization of French and um, French and the Americans, Americas, um, our kids in Louisiana have French from all over the world. They have teachers from all over the world who come in and work with them. And at one point, um, there was one of our one of our immersion students actually was at a at a store and uh, bought something, and then turned around and said to his one of his friends, he said, "Yeah, that was no nant piastre." And like, that's like three varieties of French, the Nenant with the Belgian, the centime with the French and the piastre, which means dollars. Um, with a Louisiana. Which is North American. Yeah. I, North I think American. that's so beautiful. And my, my, my daughter does that. Um, she she uh, she counts in in Belgian, but she uses pias and su and things like that when she talks about money. And I, I had to tell her one day. I was like, you know, that if when you travel abroad and you use pias in French, people are not going to know what you're talking about. You're going to have to say dollar. And she was like, what do you mean? People don't say that elsewhere. Like it, it sort of blew her mind. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joseph, to, to kind of um, move towards the end of our, our talk, could you please, I mean, you are so proficient in French. My daughter and I watch you, um, for example, when I think it was, it was one of the hurricanes last year, maybe it was Ida 
that came by and, and there you are in little tiny Greensburg, Louisiana, talking with international journalists from all over the place who wanted to know about the hurricane. And you didn't speak French until you were in some like fourth grade or something like that. What happened? Well, let's let's talk about the, the, the journalist because that's the other opportunity. So anytime there's some major disaster that's about to befall us in Louisiana, I've somehow gotten on the list of all of the, the international and French speaking networks and my actually you mentioned David Sheremy earlier so there's a few of us who when these things are coming we actually take bets to see who's going to get called first and how many times we've been called so then we sort of like one up each other so I think with Ida David was like at seven and I was like at six um and then you know it happens to Peggy at Codafil also so we just sort of have this running gag of like okay you know, let's start counting down because the the calls are going to start coming from Radio Canada, from Radio France, or these other other networks. So it's it's always interesting. But um, actually, my I, I do have Louisiana French heritage. I uh, my my first ancestors arrived from France into Louisiana around seventeen sixteen or so, but the language was lost several generations before I came along. My grandparents had friends from Le Fouche Parish who were first language French speakers. And actually, I do recall the grandmother in that family was a monolingual French speaker. She did not speak English. And this was pretty common back in the 1970s where you have elderly people who had been born at the turn or, you know, in the, in the late 19th or early 20th centuries who could not speak English. That was still very, very common in some areas of Louisiana. But her grandchildren, this woman's grandchildren, did not speak French. So you had you know, the, the grandmother who was monolingual, the parents who were bilingual, and the children who were monolingual English speakers. So uh, that was a really, really common thing in Louisiana, um, you know, only sort of 40 or 50 years ago. And so I'd been exposed to the language uh, when, when I was you know, pretty young because these were my grandparents' best friends, and I had heard it. And then when I was in fourth grade, we had uh, Codafil teachers. So Codafil is the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana. It's the only state agency of its kind in the United States that is concerned with heritage languages. Um, and so the teachers that were sent to us were from Switzerland um, at that point. So Louisiana is divided into parishes and not into counties like the rest of the country. So we have 64 parishes in the state. So these are um, administrative districts. And uh, at the in the late 1970s, early 1980s, as I understand things, Codafil had um, these um, international teachers from French-speaking countries in 62 of the 64 parishes of the state. Codafil was omnipresent. It was a brand. Everybody knew what it was in Louisiana. And so anyway, the teachers that were sent to us were from, were from Switzerland. And uh, so I was in fourth grade. We had French uh, three times a week for 30 minutes. Um, so it was really, really cursory. And an, an introductory, but it sort of just stuck. And um, you know, one of my um, great stories is uh, I actually um, I was I was nine years old, and I actually was able to find the woman who was my first French teacher, um, and reconnect with her. It's been quite a number of years ago now, and we still stay in touch on Facebook and on um, on emails and things like that. And so it's it's been a pretty pretty cool thing. And I've kept her updated and apprised of all of the stuff. And so, you know, this is, this is all really kind of thanks to you that, uh, that, that big long list of things that you read at the very beginning of this interview would never, ever have happened if that, that very timid young woman who did not speak English had not stepped into my fourth grade classroom in rural St. Helena Parish when I was nine years old. So, um, I, I, I admire the... I admire the work that, that teachers do. I admire the work that language teachers do. Um, and I know that it's not easy because even though I'm not a teacher myself, I work a lot with teachers and I see what you guys do. And I see, especially on the language side, the the hoops that you have to jump through to, to get your students engaged, to get your administrations engaged, to defend what it is that you're doing. And if, if, 
what I say today can in any way, any way inspire you, or if you would like to connect with me in any kind of way to give you ideas or just chat about what I see uh, some of your challenges might be and, and how any of the stuff that I've done over the years might be of interest or, or, or help you, I, I would be absolutely thrilled to do that because uh, I know that you guys are out there in the trenches and, and it's not easy. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I hope um, that your gift of your knowledge and your experience and your hopes for French uh, will come to reality and that teachers will be able to use some or all of what you've talked about today. And uh, yeah. This is to celebrate the Jour de la Francophonie pour le mois de mars. And as a, as a final question, uh, Joseph is so creative. I thought I would ask him if a genie could grant you three wishes, one for French in the Americas, one for French in the U.S., and one for French in Louisiana, what would they be? Well, for French in the Americas, I am going to say that my friends at the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques are doing an excellent, excellent job in promoting these connections from Canada all the way down into the, uh, into the lower Americas, into Central and South America and the Caribbean. And so that's their job, and they're doing a really good job at it, and I will leave that to them. Um, and I'm always really, really flattered to participate in their programs and to talk about the work that they do because it is amazing. It is amazing. And again, uh, teachers out there, if you're not familiar with the Centre de la Francophonie des Amériques there in Quebec, uh, please go check it out because you will find resources there and you will find a, a team of people that is very engaged in promoting the French language and working with you to, to do programming and uh, all kinds of things. For the U.S., I think it would be a uh, prise de conscience, so more understanding of the fact that there are French-speaking populations in the United States that are historically French-speaking populations that are also um, immigrant French-speaking populations uh, from the Caribbean, Haiti specifically, and also from uh, West Africa. Um, if you're not familiar with the French Heritage Language Program that is run through the FACE Foundation of the French Embassy in New York City, that's also an interesting thing to check out, especially if you are a French teacher in an area where you have heritage speakers in your classrooms. They can give you some good ideas about things to do to um, maintain French, because a lot of their focus is really sort of on, on maintaining French among these immigrant populations that are coming to the United States, who are obviously wanting to integrate and to assimilate and to have opportunities in the United States, but, you know, also with this idea that, you know, their heritage language as French is uh, also going to be beneficial to them if they maintain it and they develop it. For Louisiana specifically, I think I would say that I would like to see uh, people work more closely together in Louisiana toward a common goal of valorizing all of the varieties of French, that it would be a recognition that there has always been a diversity of people who speak French in Louisiana and how we can uh, put our hands together and overcome some of the um, some, some of the obstacles, some of the, the silos, uh, things like that. Um, I would also like to see um, more focus in Louisiana on the idea of, in the universities, developing programs that are beyond language and literature, that are really about preparing especially the immersion students coming from the immersion schools for, um, uh, for, for more creative kinds of things in French um, that, again, is beyond just simple literature classes, communications classes, media classes, things that allow them to actually use their French beyond, um, beyond Flaubert or, or la littérature. Wow. 
Thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, I, I would like to add one little thing after that. Um, first of all, thanks for your gift um, of time and your knowledge and your experiences, as I've already said. And to all of you French teachers out there, I really hope that you are now aware that there is a huge community of uh, French speakers around the world that you can tap into and hook into for support and for opportunities for you and your students. Joseph, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, ouais, c'est moi qui te remercie de m'avoir invité parce que ce fut un vrai plaisir de parler avec toi et de partager toutes ces informations parce que uh, ça me fait toujours plaisir en fait. Uh, et, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I've gotten to, to this place with, with all of this stuff where, you know, I, I, nothing gives me a greater, um, greater pleasure and gratitude to actually be able to share some of this stuff with people. So, um, you know, I, I hope it's been helpful. All right. Merci beaucoup, Joseph. Merci à toi. Au revoir.